Income tax 2023-2024. Child and dependent care expenses credit. How to figure the credit part number two. Get ready and some coffee because we're providing inspiration about income tax preparation. 2023-2024. Most of this information. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So... You know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Mention can be found in Publication 503, Child and Dependent Care Expenses Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. The taxable income basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But it's only half the battle. We have the second half of the formula starting by taking that taxable income, calculating the tax based on that using a progressive tax system for the most part. And we know that some items of income might have other tax rates other than ordinary income, such as qualified dividends, long-term capital gains. But that gets us to the tax before credits and other taxes. We then have to deal with the credits and other taxes. So the other taxes could include things like self-employment tax if they were a Schedule C type of business. The credits are our point of focus at this point. Remember, credits and deductions are both good for taxes, but if you had a dollar deduction, it would simply decrease the taxable income, the benefit then being dependent on our tax bracket, only giving us a part of that dollar deduction in benefit. If we had a dollar credit, however, we might get the full dollar of benefit if we had the tax liability to consume that dollar of benefit. The credits up here then being limited by the liability because if they were to take us below that point, we would no longer have a tax system that we're looking at, but we would be using the tax code as a welfare benefit social safety net program. So that would give us the tax, the total tax. Then we have tax payments and refundable credits. So we have more credits down here. These credits could take us down below a tax liability of zero, resulting in us using the tax system as a form of safety net welfare or benefit program. That's why it's down here with the payments. Payments, of course, include W-2 withholdings, estimated tax payments, and so on, to finally get to the tax refund or tax due. So we're looking at the child and dependent care expenses credit, which is not to be confused with the child tax credit, the credit most commonly automatically basically associated with a child. That's the first credit that would typically come to mind. This one being related to dependent care for the child. The goal of that dependent care is to allow someone to work. Therefore, it has an earned income component. Uh, to the calculation of this credit or being able to take the credit, which we've talked about in prior presentations. Here's schedule three, additional credits and uh, payments, part number one. This is the non-refundable credit section. Line two, credit for child and dependent care expenses from form 2441, which flows in to the form 1040, page number two, and the tax and credits section, where we have line 20 amount from uh, schedule three, line eight. All right, so we're continuing on considering self-employment earnings. So if we think about this credit, the idea is that we're paying someone to take care of the child in order to free up the individual, the parent, to work, and therefore there needs to be a component of earned income in order to justify 
the credit. Now, usually that's W-2 income, but you could also have a self-employment type of situation with a Schedule C. Now, just to point out that the incentives with some of these credits, like this credit and possibly the uh, earned income credit for sure in some cases, and possibly uh, the, the child tax credit, could have situations where if your earned income goes up, then you actually get more of a tax benefit, which is reversed to what it normally is, which is you're trying to lower your income because you're being taxed on the on the in, on the income, right? So if if you if it gets reversed, then what the tax system has to watch out for is people trying to report income that's not legitimate in order to increase the credits because they possibly already aren't paying any tax liability and now or very little. And if they were to increase the income, they would get credits related to it. The biggest one usually being the earned income tax credit. So if they don't have a lot of W-2 wages, you might see some incentive to find some other place to put earned income in place so that they could so that they can increase their earned income, which is not legal to do. I'm just saying that's the in tax incentive. If people are trying to increase the amount of benefit they would get, the first place they would look most likely would be the Schedule C. But remember, when we put stuff into the schedule, if you have Schedule C income, that's going to be also subject to the self-employment tax, possibly Social Security uh, and Medicare. So just a couple things that all this stuff kind of pulls together just to keep in mind. So if you are self-employed, include your net earnings and earn income. So for purposes of the child and dependent care credit, net earnings from self-employment generally means the amount from Schedule SE form 1040. Why Schedule SE and not Schedule C? Because they're basically saying, if you have this earned income, you're going to be hit not only with the federal income taxes, but with the Social Security and Medicare, right? So you might want to think twice, I think is the general idea before trying to increase your income in order to take advantage of low income credits, which are supposed to be for welfare programs and whatnot, because you're going to get hit not only with the federal income taxes, which which might be below the threshold, but with Social Security and Medicare taxes, right? So that's going to be line three minus deduction for self-employment tax on Schedule 1, Form 1040, line 15. So include your self-employment earnings and earn income, even if they are less than $400 uh, and you don't file Schedule SE, Form 1040. All right clergy and church employees so this is somewhat of the unusual situation where we always have this clergy situation that has specific rules related to them so if you are a member of the clergy or church employee see the instructions for form 2441 for details statutory employee if you file schedule c form 1040 to report income as a statutory employee also include as earned income the amount from line one of schedule c uh, form 1040 net loss you must reduce your earned income by any net loss now so notice the schedule c if we have income minus expenses and the expenses are larger than the income we have a loss now, with a loss situation, if we don't have any other income to assign it to, then we're, we just don't have any income. But we might have like W-2 income and then a loss on the Schedule C. And if we apply the Schedule C income to the W-2 income, then the question is, I'm, is that going to impact my calculation of some of these credits? Because it's now going to be reducing my net income. And the, and the idea is that I, have to, I could have a situation where I have to increase net income in order to be in a more favorable situation for some of these credits because the credit actually goes up as the income goes up. So again, losses are usually good for taxes. They're bad for business, but good for taxes, but it could backfire in the case of if you have these earned in these credits because it could lower the earned income resulting in uh, lower credit calculations. So optional method uh, if earnings are low or a net loss. So if your net earnings from self-employment are low or you have a net loss, you may be able to figure your net earnings by using a, an optional method instead of the regular method. So now we have optional, there might be another method that we can calculate in essence the net income, which could result in 
a higher net income or typically would result in a higher net income, which in some cases might be beneficial because the credits are making the whole income tax system backwards where we would actually want higher income instead of lower income. So for that, you could see publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for details. So if you use an optional method to figure net earnings from self-employment tax purposes, include those net earnings in your earned income for this credit. So in this case, subtract any deduction you claimed on Schedule 1, Form 1040, Line 15, from the total of the amounts on Schedule SE, Form 1040, Line 3, and uh, 4B to figure your net earnings. So that gets a little bit wonky. You might, in this case, subtract any deduction you claimed on Schedule 1, Line 15. So remember that on Schedule 1, if you have a Schedule C business, then what ends up happening, you you have a lot more complexity to uh, the tax code. And part of that complexity is that you're going to have some deductions that might be related to the business that are actually on the Schedule 1 rather than the Schedule C. And it's kind of a similar situation to a W-2 where you might have like box one of your federal income is different than box five of your uh, Medicare income because they want to have different things subject to tax for Medicare and Social Security versus your federal income taxes on a Schedule C business. The Schedule C is basically like box one of the Form 1040. It's going to be impacting uh, your federal income taxes, but also Social Security and Medicare. I'm sorry, that's more like box three and five, right? And then box one is kind of like your Schedule C plus the Schedule One which has certain things that are deducted for federal income taxes, but not for Social Security and Medicare, such as half of the self-employment uh, tax, uh, for example. Okay, so you or your spouse is a student or not able to care for self. So what does that mean? Your spouse who is either a full-time student or not able to care for themselves is treated as having earned income. So meaning... If you're married, the idea is that if you have a spouse that's not working, then they should be able to take care of the kid is the idea, unless they're not capable of doing that, possibly with the exception that they're allowing for a student or uh, or they're not able to, to do so for them because of the their self-care uh, capacity. Uh, has his or her earned income for each month is considered to be at least $250 if there is one qualifying person in your home or at least $500 if there are two or more qualifying persons at any time during the year. Spouse works. So if your spouse works during that month, use the higher of $250 or $500 if his or her actual earned income for that month. So spouse qualifies for part of month. So if your spouse is a full-time student or not able to care for themselves for only part of a month, the full 250 or 500 still applies for that month. That's kind of them. So you are a student or not able to care for yourself. So these rules also apply if you are a student or not able to care for yourself and are filing a joint return. Obviously, it's the same thing in reserve reverse. You have two people. You are the spouse of your spouse, obviously, uh, you know, so it's just a matter whose name is first on the tax return. But for each month or part of a month, you are a student or not able to care for yourself. Your earned income is considered to be at least 250 or $500. If you also work during the month, use the higher of 250 or $500 or your actual earned income for that month. Both spouses qualify. So if in the same month, both you and your spouse are either full-time students or not able to care for yourself, only one spouse can be considered to have these earned income of 250 or 500 for that month. Example, so Jim works and keeps up a home for himself and his wife, Sharon. Because of an accident, Sharon isn't able to care for herself for 11 months during the tax year. It was a tragic accident, but hopefully, I think she's gonna be okay after that. Hopefully, we'll pray for her. So during the 11 months, Jim pays $3,300 of work-related expenses to Sharon's care. So these expenses also qualify as medical expenses. Their adjusted gross income is $29,000 and the entire amount in Jim's uh, entire amount is Jim's earned income. So we can imagine he's got like W-2 income 
of the 29,000. Jim and Sharon's earned income limit is the smallest of the following amounts. So Jim and Sharon's earned income. Work-related uh, expenses that Jim paid, 3,300. Jim's earned income, the 29,000. Income considered earned by Sharon, the 11 months times uh, the 250. All right, Jim and Sharon can use 2,750 to figure the credit and treat the balance of 550, that's the 3,300 minus 2,750, as medical expenses. So notice some of the, just some of the issues here when we look at this, we're saying, okay, well, they're married. So if they're gonna claim this credit, the idea is that they, they have to have, both of them have to have generally some earned income, you would think, because the idea of the credit would be that, would be that it's freeing up a spouse to work and if only one spouse is working you would consider the other spouse could be taking care of the kid but we're saying that she's unable to take care of the kid because of an accident right so in that case you would think that you would still possibly need to pay someone to take care of the kid because the other one the other spouse is unable to take care of the kid and then you have this well there's an earned income kind of calculation typically with regards to the credit because you're supposed to be freeing people up in order to take the credit. So we have to apply the earned income to both spouses uh, generally. So, so we have to treat both spouses as having earned income. You have to make sure that you mark that off on the tax return or in your tax software, which isn't always important for most other things because we're one entity for taxes. But for this calculation, because we're trying to see if one spouse can or cannot take care of the kid, you have to apply some income to both of them generally in order to properly calculate the tax. So again, if you had tax software that you can use the, hopefully the data input will make it a little bit easier to work with those calculations, but you wanna have a general idea down so that you could double check the calculations and kind of be able to explain what is going on. So you'll notice that the work-related uh, expenses 3,300 that were qualified expenses. So, so you would think if you could deduct those on either Schedule A medical expenses or as a credit, you'd get a bigger benefit for the credit. However, we're limited on the deduction for the credit by the amount of income of the spouse, which is the 250 that's being allocated to the spouse times the 11 months, which is 2,750. Therefore, of the qualifying 3,300, we're limited to the credit of only the 2,750, which leaves the difference, uh, the difference that, of the 550 that could still be used for medical expenses on the Schedule A. Now, remember the medical expenses on the Schedule A, might you might not get any benefit for that. Most, a lot of people won't because you might not be taking the itemized, you might just be taking the standard deduction. And even if you're itemizing, you have to clear a floor of like 7.5% of the AGI before those are even beneficial. So, so you could then allocate those to medical expenses if they were beneficial, but they might not be, right? However, if they use the 3,300 first as medical expenses, they can't use any part of that amount to figure the credit. So you could choose, okay, I'm not gonna allocate it to the credit. I'm gonna add it, add it to the medical expenses, which usually would not be the most beneficial thing to do because usually the credit's gonna give you a bigger benefit than the medical expenses. But in some cases, maybe it pushes you over the threshold to take the medical expenses on the Schedule A or something like that. In which case, if you took the whole 3,300 for medical expenses, you can't apply it to the credit as well because you'd be double dipping. Example number two, for all of the year, Karen is a full-time student and Mark, Karen's husband, is an individual who is incapable of self-care. Karen and Mark have no earned income and pay expenses of $5,000 to Mark's care. So either Karen or Mark may be deemed to have $3,000 of earned income. However, earned income may be attributed to only one spouse. So now you have the situation where they're both have have aren't able to care for themselves but you can only apply this assignment of the income to one person therefore the lesser of karen and mark's earned income is zero so karen and mark may not take the expenses into account and may not claim the credit for the year so dollar limitation so there is a dollar limit on the amount you uh, of your work related expenses you can use to figure the credit now, again, you might say, well, why are they work-related? That, that term might sound a little confusing. Remember, the credit is here to pay. You have the expenses 
for the kid. They're kid related to take care of the kid, but you're trying to get this kid out of, out of here so you can work. Then that's why that's why they're work related, right? They're work related. They're trying to freeing you up your time so you can work. So this limit is three thousand if you had if you had one qualifying person, or six thousand if you had two or more qualifying persons. So tip. So the maximum amount of work related expenses you can take into account for purposes of the credit is six thousand if you have two or more qualifying persons, even if you only incurred expenses for just one of them. So for example. If you have three qualifying children, uh, age three uh, and one age 11, and you incur 6,000 of qualifying work-related expenses for that three-year-old and no qualifying work-related expenses for the 11-year-old, you can use 6,000 to figure the credit. So that's kind of counterintuitive, right? So you're saying, okay, well, it's 3,000 per kid up to two kids. You'd think I'd have 3,000 per kid that I can be applying for the expenses related to this credit, but you would assume that it would be for, I'd have to pay 3,000 for the one kid's care and 3,000 for the other kid's care. Like if, if you paid a baby, if you paid a care provider for that was taking care of both of them, you can assume it would be evenly split. But they're saying, no, if you have two qualifying kids, then you can have up to $6,000, even though you're paying the 6,000 on one versus the other. Now, obviously, if you had two kids and one of them was older than the age limit, like an example we saw before, then then they no longer qualify f to, to push up the cap, you would think, from, from 3,000 to 6,000 for the two kids because the second one doesn't qualify. In this case, you have two of them that would qualify even though you didn't pay expenses for one of them, but you paid twice the expenses for the other one but the limit still went up to 6,000. Okay, so in this situation, you should list 6,000 for the three-year-old and zero for the 11-year-old. The 6,000 limit would be used to compute your credit unless you have already exceeded your deducted uh, dependent care benefits paid to you or on your behalf by your employer. Yearly limit. The dollar limit is a yearly limit, obviously. So the amount of dollar limit remains the same no matter how long during the year you have a qualifying person in your household. So use the $3,000 limit if you had one qualifying person at any time during the year, 6,000 if you had more than one qualifying person at any time during the year. So that's actually maybe not as intuitive as I, as I originally thought, right? So they're not saying a partial year calculation because a kid was born or something during uh, the year or they turned you know uh, they unqualified because of age limit or something possibly example so you pay 500 a month uh for after school care for your son so and they, that, that's a bargain to have that to have the, anyway he turned 13 at may 1st and is no longer a qualifying person uh, you can use the $2,000 of expenses for his care January through April to figure your credit because uh, it isn't more than the $3,000 yearly limit. All right, example number two. In July of this year, to permit your spouse to begin a new job, you enrolled a three-year-old daughter in a nursery school that provides preschool child care. So you paid $400 per month for the child care. So you can use the full $2,400 uh, you paid 400 times six as qualifying expenses because it isn't more than the six, the 3,000 yearly limit. So you see what's happening here is you, you might be saying, well, look, I only, I only did that for part of the year. So you would think maybe I would have to prorate the limit down to like the time that the care was, was taken care of. But no, it's a yearly uh, limit of the 3,000. All right. Reduced dollar limit. If you received uh, dependent care benefits that you exclude or deduct from your income, you must subtract that amount from the dollar limit that applies to you. Your reduced dollar limit is figured on Form 2441, Part 3. See dependent care benefits earlier for information on including and deducting these benefits. Example, George is a, is a widower with one child and earns $24,000 a year. He pays work-related expenses of $2,900 to take care of the kids so he can work. 
for the care of his four-year-old child and qualifies to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses. His employer pays directly to his dependent care provider an additional $1,000 under a qualified dependent care benefit plan. So now his employer is basically giving him wages, right? But it's not going to him, it's going to the person that, so instead of it going to him and then he pays it to the care provider, they're paying it to the care provider on his behalf in a similar way as basically withholding for taxes, right? So that's like a form of income that hopefully isn't gonna be included in box one of the form W-2 because it's gonna be something that's not gonna be included in, in taxes. So this 1,000 is excluded from George's income. So it's not in box one of the W-2, so he's not gonna be paying taxes on it, even though he got a benefit from it. Although the dollar limit for his work-related expenses is 3,000, one qualifying person, George figures his credit on only 2,000. So in other words, if he had to pay more than the 1,000, then then he has a yearly limit, which is now 2,000. Why? Because, because 1,000 was paid by the employer right so that makes so it's still kind of three thousand but one he got a benefit of the one thousand that was paid by the employer that was given as a deduction as opposed to a credit because it was taken out of his wages and then the other rest that he's going to put in is going to be calculated towards the credit so george figures his credit on only two thousand of the two thousand nine hundred work-related expenses he paid this is because his dollar limit is reduced as shown next so we got the George's dollar limit. The maximum expenses for one qualifying person is 3,000, but then we had to subtract the dependent care benefit George excluded from income, 1,000, new dollar limit, 2,000. Example two, Ronald, he's, a mar he's married and both he and his wife are employed. That's nice. So it's a nice, we have a good, good solid couple here. They're not, no one's, no one's having medical issues and everything. That's a good start, that's encouraging. Each has earned income in excess of $6,000. They have two children and an Andy ages two and four who attend a daycare facility licensed and regulated by the state. So Randall's work-related expenses are 6,000 for the year. So he spent 6,000 uh, to pay for the, the care of the child. So Randall's employer has a dependent care assistance program, uh, part of his cafeteria plan, which allows employees to make pre-tax contributions to dependent care flexible spending arrangement. So Randall has elected to take maximum 5,000 exclusion from his salary to cover dependent care expenses through his program. So now he's taking advantage of the tax benefits on the employer side, which means it's gonna be reduced from box one of his income, you would think again. Although the dollar limit for his work-related expenses is 6,000, two or more qualifying persons, Randall figures his credit on only 1,000 of the 6,000 work-related expenses paid. This is because his dollar limit is reduced as shown next. So same thing, maximum allowable limit is now 6,000 for the two kids, but he already got a benefit of the 500 be, uh, 5,000 because of the employer benefit thing that he's going to get a benefit not with a credit but with a deduction from the income on the W-2 in that case and therefore his limit has now been reduced for the calculation of the credit of the 1,000 or to the 1,000 amount of credit. So de to determine the amount of your credit, multiply your work-related expenses, the expenses that you paid for the kid so that you could work, after applying the earned income and dollar limits by a percentage. So here we go. The percent depends on the adjusted gross income. All right, here we go again. Another kind of wrinkle in the system showing on form 1040, 1040, SR 1040 in our line 11. So it's gonna phase out, of course, with a relation to the income level. The following table shows the percent to use based on adjusted gross income. So here's your percentages. So, so, uh, uh, it, th so here's 15,000. If your adjusted gross income is over this, but not over that, uh, then the percentage is. So we've got uh, 15,000 boom, boom, 34%, duh, 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 and it's going up. Now, notice what's happening with this particular table. We don't have any adjustments for basically different filing statuses, such as uh, head of household versus the married uh, filing joint, which is interesting. So to qualify for the credit, you must have one or more qualifying person. 
You should show the expenses for each person on form 2441, line 2, column D. So it, uh, it, is possible, uh, it is possible a qualifying person could have no expenses and a second qualified person have expenses exceeding 3000 which we talked about before. You'd still want to list out both qualifying persons because then that still might increase the, the level that you can take for the credit even though it was paid to the one person when you had two people qualifying. So you should list zero for the one person and the actual amount for the second person, the 6,000 limit that applies to two or more qualifying persons would be used to figure your credit unless you already excluded or deducted in part three of form 2441, certain dependent care benefits paid to you or on your behalf by your employer. Example, Roger and Megan Paris have two qualifying children. Susan is nine. She's a beautiful little child. She's a nine-year-old. And James is 15, the little crazy, crazy 15-year-old uh, and is, is dazed, he's disabled. That's sad. So they received, well, here we go with these sad ones again. So they received $1,000 of dependent care benefits from Megan's employer during 2023, but they incurred a total of $19,500 of child and dependent care expenses. So we have a significant amount of expenses. You would think more of them applying uh, to James because of, of his disability. So they complete part three of form 2441 to exclude the 1,000 from their taxable income offsetting 1,000 of their expenses. So Roger and Megan continue to line 27 to figure their credit using the remaining 18,500 of expenses. So line 30 tells them to complete line two without including any dependent care benefits. They complete line two of form 2441 listing both Susan and James as shown in line two ex example. They check the box uh, in column C to indicate that James is disabled. So here's the example. So the qualifying person, uh, qualifying person's social security number. Check here uh, if the qualifying person was over age 12 and was disabled. Check box made. So qualified expenses you incurred and paid in 2023 for the person listed in column. So, so the second one, James, is he over the 13 yeah he's over the 13 limit that's why they had that's why they he's disabled because that makes him still qualifying even though he's uh, over the limit and then this first person susan nothing's being applied to them but you still want to put susan on the list because that increases the total yearly limit even though we so you would think it would go from 3000 to 6000 even though we didn't pay anything for susan because she's fine all of the payments that were made for James, it might still increase the total that we can pay from 3,000 to 6,000 to have them both listed. So all of Susan's expenses were covered by the 1,000 of employer provided benefit care benefits. So this was covered by the, they also have a benefit program, meaning it reduced the, the W-2 income in box one. However, their son James has special needs and they paid $18,500 for his care. Line three imposes a 5,000 limit for two or more children. So that's the 6,000 limit because it was 3,000 per kid minus the 1,000. That's going to bring us to the 5,000 that we still have left that we can take here. And, and that's in part based on the fact that it would have been 6,000 because you have the two kids and then minus the 1,000 that was already taken out of the W-2 income, which was given by the employer through the benefits. Okay, so even though line two indicates one of Paris children didn't have any dependent care expenses, it doesn't change the fact that they had two qualifying children for purposes of form 2441. Payments for prior year expenses. So if you had work-related expenses in 2022 that you paid in 2023 and you don't claim a credit on the maximum amount of qualifying expenses in 2022, you may be able to increase the amount of credit you can take in 2023 to figure the credit complete worksheet A in the instructions for form 2441, enter the amount of the credit on form 2441. So we have like a cutoff kind of issue because usually we're using a cash based kind of system but now you have a system where a payment was made in the following year for the prior year so how to claim the credit 
So to claim your credit, you can file form 1040, 1040SR, 1040NR. You must complete form 2441 and attach it to your form 1040, 1040SR, or 1040NR. Enter the credit on your Schedule 3, Form 1040, Line 2. The amount of credit you can claim is limited to your tax. So, in other words, it's non-refundable uh, as opposed to like the, the earned income credit, which could take the tax below zero, right? So, you can't get a refund for any part of the credit that is more than this limit. For more information, you can see the instructions for Form 2441.